you, you've got time to be writing your checks while I talk, so take all the time you need. And I hope that you do have a generous gift. But I, uh, I want to go through quickly the steps that we've taken thus far. We've gone through eight principles. Remember, we're, we're not uh, concentrating on methodology or programs. We're talking about principles that will undergird a lifestyle. And you work for the principles or the, the methods that will work in your particular situation. But recognizing the Great Commission is a command given to all the followers of Christ, we began by observing his mission is to reach all the nations, all the peoples of the earth, to bring the redeeming grace of God. And to that end, he told us to make disciples, because when you make disciples, those who truly learn by following Christ, you assure ultimately reproduction, because they will learn of Christ as they follow him, grow in his character, and will become involved in what he's doing. You don't have to be a theologian to recognize that the focus of Jesus' own personal ministry was upon making disciples. And as they in turn catch this same vision in their lifestyle and pass it on through that process of multiplication, someday the world will hear the gospel. But we begin by recognizing the command is to the church not to just make converts, get people saved, but to truly develop men and women who will follow Christ. We began by noting how Jesus became a servant, that principle of the incarnation which undergirds his ministry, which established credibility for what he was saying. And when you are known as a servant, then you will never lack an opportunity to make some disciples. People are drawn to those who show they care about them. And this involves, though, the recognition of your limitations. You're not going to have the ability to respond to all the needs. In fact, as you're effective in caregiving, you'll be overwhelmed by those who want attention. So the principle of selection comes into view. You look for those that God in his providence seems especially to have drawn into your life. And this is no accident. This is an answer to your prayers. As you have been asking the Lord of the harvest to send forth workers into this harvest field of the world. And likely those people will come out of the context of where you live every day. They're on your same wavelength. You might say they're your peer group. I think of a fellow out in West Texas that was arrested for horse stealing. And he was asked by the sheriff, did he want to be uh, tried by the judge or by jury of his peers? The man looked confused. He said, well, who's that? <laughs> and he said, well, that means people just like you. Oh, he said. I'll take the judge. I don't want to be tried by a bunch of horse thieves. Now, if you'll look around, you'll see your crowd where you're already known and probably have some influence. And likely in that context, wherever you're planted, you'll have your greatest opportunity to make disciples. And you do it by recognizing that next principle of association, being together. It's the most elemental rule of education. Someone said a college is a professor on one end of a log and a student on the other end. Well, now that's an oversimplification, of course, but the, the lesson is clear. The opportunity that you have in learning is directly and proportional the way you can be with your teacher. And this is how you're going to develop the potential of that person who is a learner. It's like a family. And making disciples is just like growing up kids. And that is, incidentally, why everybody ultimately can understand the Great Commission as they grow up. Because if you've got any sense at all, you can look back upon your own experience 
and you can appreciate what seemed to work, what was effective in your life. And you can say, well, that's what I want to do myself. And of course, those failures that you had along the way, many come from dysfunctional families. You say, I don't want to go through that tunnel again. So you correct it. But because everyone has grown up in a family, you already have all the ingredients of understanding the Great Commission if you just use common sense. Anybody can understand the Great Commission if they would look at their own life and see what has worked in developing them for the good. And that relationship is going to be the glue now that holds it all together. But you're not just having a good time together. You are learning how to pick up the cross and follow Jesus. And so the principle of consecration comes into focus. You learn by following Christ. Obedience is not just the witness of your faith. It's the way that you continue to learn. And there's no foreclosure on what can be learned if you'll just follow the truth that you know today. You'll learn more as you go on down the trail. And so life becomes a journey. We're always moving on. And as David Livingston said, I'll go anywhere as long as it's forward. As long as you're moving along in the way that God is leading you, you're continually learning. But it's not just a sense of duty that constrains you. You remember, it is the great commandment to love God and your neighbor as yourself. This is the motivation for the work that makes you really fall in love with the law. To love. And in that process, you will have the opportunity by example to teach the principle of demonstration, which is the way that we most easily learn. And they watch you in your own life of, of prayer, the way you use the word. They see your generosity in, in giving, your stewardship. They see your compassion for a world they recognize how you share the gospel with others and of course they are also learning how you make disciples so that finally the Great Commission becomes to them very obvious because they have seen it lived out before their eyes and as you continue to learn this way you are getting involved that principle of delegation at first uh, it's basically just being there when he is teaching, showing up. But quickly you find other ways that you can be of assistance in places where you're already able to assist. And as those uh, privileges expand, as you learn more, you're continually growing in the application of your skills and your gifts. And of course, that is finally explicated by Jesus in the command, now you go and do what I've been doing. That's what the Great Commission is. It simply states the way that Christ had been focusing his lifestyle and now he asked the disciples to continue in the same way that they have learned. And as you move on continually growing getting more and more involved in this mission you have the need for supervision you are often going to make mistakes and you're going to learn from failures you're going to in that context of continual contact checking up on each other you're going to discover more and more ways to apply uh, the Great Commission and to whom much is given, much is required. And of course the, the great way that this is, is nourished is, is going to be through prayer. You can't always be together, but you can still pray for each other. We were reminded of that as Andrew and his family are leaving. Uh, you can pray for them even when they're not here. And ultimately, this is the way we're going to have our greatest impact. Jesus said, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he 
send forth the workers. This is the undertaking of God. We're, we're just uh, assistants. We're, we're just working alongside. But the work is by God. It's all a work of grace. And He alone is worthy of glory. But you're always looking to the day when, when the harvest is gathered. Remember how Jesus one time uh, as he went through Samaria he uh, talked with this woman at the well she discovered that he was her Messiah she rushed back into town to give her testimony and meanwhile the disciples returned they saw the water jar still at the well they realized that Jesus had been talking to this woman they had quite a disgraceful reputation as far as I know he never did get his drink but they were surprised that he had missed his lunch and they urged him, to, urged him to eat something you remember how he said my food is to do the will of him that sent me that's what gave him nourishment and then he said open your eyes look out there don't you see the harvest well those dim witted disciples looked out there and all they could see was recently planted fields of grain barren of course Jesus wanted them to use the eyes of faith to see what God was doing and if they would look they could see in the distance some men now coming out from the village you've heard the testimony of this redeemed woman they want to know more don't you see them they're walking through the fields they're coming to Jesus the harvest is ready many of them already have believed on the witness of the woman but as they talk with Jesus now we're told many more believe and they urge him to stay longer and for two extra days he remains with them doing follow up doing some initial discipling and when he leaves verse 42 tells us in that chapter those Samaritan men realized that Jesus was the savior of the world the whole world those disciples yet hadn't come to see that world vision they were thinking basically of their own little group of Jewish people but he's teaching them to project your vision for the world that God loves and for whom Jesus will give his life on the cross he's always projecting the vision of the day that the gospel will be heard to the ends of the earth and a great commission will be fulfilled and that excites us and we've already read the last chapter. We know how it's going to end. So wherever we are in this continuum of time, we know the victory is certain. It puts a spring in your step and a sparkle in your eye because you have the victory. It's already present in the Word of God. I tell you, that keeps you going when things are tough because you have seen the coming of the kingdom. Well, that's where we are today, but I want to give you some questions now before I line this up tonight with the final principle. So, here's your chance. What still needs to be said? Yes? Okay. How do I balance that the, the principle of reaching out and loving people when you gave us the example of Zacchaeus? Um, reaching out to minister to people's needs. How do I balance that with the principle of selection? Um, I see a whole bunch of needs that need to be met and you want to love people, and yet... How do you turn it off when someone doesn't want to learn? Well, that is not easy because as I tried to say, the demands will increase depending upon your effectiveness in demonstrating your concern. And I think you have to be nice to these people and you have to continue to show that you love them. But there is a limit to what we can do with a person because our time is limited. Jesus recognized his own limitations. He couldn't be with all the people that wanted attention. And the, the number grew into hundreds before he returned to the Father. And so in that recognition of his human limitations that he accepted when he became one with us, he selected a smaller group that was a group that he could relate to who wanted to learn. Even there, you see one turned out to be a traitor. But we invest in those who want to learn and in the beginning we don't know for sure how it's going to turn out. And so you try to have some 
natural times together when you can begin to feel their interest and uh, you're looking for those who seem to have a delight in uh, making time to be with you who will go out of the way to show interest and that involves on their part some commitment perhaps even an element of sacrifice and that will become evident as you are together and they begin to take initiative to show they really want to learn and that's when I make that, un that conscious decision here's where I need to spend a little more time I don't like to ever dismiss a person say I just don't have time for you I just uh, don't arrange to be with them quite as much in order that I can be with this other person who wants attention it's not that I love the others any less it's for the sake of the others that I have to concentrate on a few that's what Jesus is teaching me I can't personally reach everyone that needs help but I can reach a few and so as I learn who those few are who I can relate let's face it I turn some people off I scare some students half to death when I get excited and they're sitting on the front row I notice the next day they're sitting in the back of the room because it's hard for me to distinguish between teaching and preaching and when I get into it I just turn loose and some of these students up in New England aren't used to that and I know I don't relate to everybody I don't relate to everyone here but I feel a special responsibility to those who I can relate to and especially those who want to spend some extra time and will go out of your way to be with me that's why I set the hour very early in the morning that I meet with and there are other conditions as well as we get into it I begin to add to it because I'm very limited in what I can do is there another question? Yes. Um, in your uh, principle of concentration, um, one of your points was to expose to situations that challenge their commitment. Could you expound on that a little bit? Well, that's a good question. One reason uh, you're here is because this is a situation where you can continue to learn. And so take them along with you when you go to a meeting like this and I think most of you have done that I had dinner with a group tonight that uh, whole crowd came along and that's the way to travel travel with someone else don't ever go any place by yourself if you can help it make your time pay double and one of the most natural ways is when you go any place go along with somebody maybe several people and that gets at this 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 question that you've raised here and uh, I think that by being sensitive here at, 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 the, at the opportunities that come and respect our own limitations we, we, can, we can handle it yes why haven't you talked about impartation I'm going to come to that I saved it for the end because that's what puts it all together I changed the outline just a little in the, in the book for the sake of this presentation tonight. As I said earlier, these principles all flow together. You can forget the outline. Just remember the principles. But we'll come to importation tonight. There's a question back here. That, that's your own personal relationship that you experience with Christ your prayer life talk about some of the prayers that God has answered and how in your weakness you've been forced to show your more dependence upon Christ and especially in your times of suffering where your faith has reached out and laid hold upon the promises of God and, and how in your weakness you discovered his strength this is the inner life of the soul it's your communion with the Spirit of God in your daily life it's sort of an ongoing testimony that you can share in just casual ways as you're together you don't just say well now I'm giving a testimony just let it slip out and continually be 
sharing those kind of experiences that are up to date, that are real. So the other person realizes that this isn't something that just happened 20 years ago. This is something that is present. And it's a very real experience to you now. Another question. Sure. Yes. Uh, there's some in the uh, emerging church movement that uh, would say that the Gospels are more important to us than the rest of the Scripture. Uh, how would you uh, feel about that point of view? And secondly, uh, how do you integrate the message of the Great Commission that's in the Gospels with the messages that we see in the rest of the Scripture? That's an interesting question. In fact, for a number of years I've been working on that question in um, a basic theology of the gospel. Because I see the gospel is flowing through the whole Bible. And every tenet of theology has the application to the gospel it saves. That's the whole reason we have a Bible. God loved us so much he gave us a revelation. And these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ and that believing you may have life in his name. That's the whole reason we have theology. And I try to tell my students, the reason that you're studying these various things is to win a world. And if you don't see evangelism and discipleship and the Great Commission in your theology, you're wasting your time in that class because that's the purpose of it. That's the reason you're in seminary. That's the reason you study the Bible. Not just to see how much knowledge you can attain but how you can fulfill God's plan to reach the world. That's the purpose of it. And the gospel is going to flow through the Bible, no matter what particular doctrine you're dealing with. Now, what I'm a little afraid of in this emergent church is that by the gospel, they relate it basically to the, to the, the theology of conversion in repentance, turning from our sin, in brokenness, and like a little child accepting Jesus as Savior, all by grace. And certainly this must be the beginning, but the gospel relates to the way he's conforming us to the image of Christ, changing us from glory to glory, even by the Spirit of the Lord. Because the gospel is building us up in Christ, uh, not for just our own selfish, selfish desire of a blessing, but because we can be an instrument through which the Spirit of God can work to accomplish His mission, to accomplish His purpose. And that's why we desperately need more teaching on the dimension of sanctification, of how the Spirit of God is working to perfect a group of people in the image of Christ. There's depths here that we have not yet fully explored. And that's what my heart hungers for. That's what I yearn for. And I'm afraid the emergent church in trying to concentrate on the gospel may be overlooking the deeper dimensions of salvation. It's all salvation. But it's more than just in repentance and faith turning to Christ and experiencing the new birth. But I hope that new birth comes through clear. You, till you get saved, you can't, you're not in a position to really start growing. And one of the problems, I think, in churches is we're trying to grow people that have never been converted. And so they can't respond because they don't know what it is. But once they come to Christ, oh, lead them on. There's so much more beyond. And I don't think we are ever finished in this world. Thankfully, God is not through with us yet. And I believe that that learning process will continue on throughout eternity. And the more we discover, the more we will want to learn. And the more we learn, our capacity to learn will grow. And so it's an endless dimension, an endless cycle of learning throughout eternity. I don't say it's just up there sitting around uh, talking about old times, why we're going to be challenged by new things, new joys that we have not yet even dreamed of. Another question. Yes. It usually takes more than three or four years to grasp the bulk of what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. And yet college students are gone in four 
many time military guys don't stay in more than three or four. And so we just get started and then we lose these things. Right. Uh, have you run across any answers on, on how to either follow them into their workplace or recruit them back so that they can get that second tour and grasp this thing so that when they do go out, they'll make a bigger impact? Well, I understand exactly your frustration because that's very similar to a teacher. My students I may have for a year, two years, maybe even three years, but I may not get to know them until their last year. And so it's the same situation. They're coming and they're going, which is all the more reason we need to try to focus on this principle of developing a few that will catch a vision for reproduction. And you can't do it with everybody, but you can with a few. And try to give them that sense that wherever God leads them, they can be the initiator of an ongoing work. They can be a, a planter of a new ministry that will reach a larger group. And that's where your joy will come in as you try to keep in touch by email or by phone. I can't do this with everyone, but I do have a, a lot of old students that still keep in touch with me. Ajith Fernando sends an email almost every other week and especially when he when he's going through some hard times as he is now and I had to tell him I just I don't know where you get the time I just can't keep up with all these emails you're sending and he said I understand Dr. Cole but I still want you to know what I'm doing so you can pray for me and this is another beautiful thing about that relationship he was in my little fellowship 30 years ago at Asbury but now he's far surpassed me he directs the Youth for Christ over in Sri Lanka, which is the largest evangelical work in that whole nation. But not only that, as his exposition of scripture has become known, he's replaced John Stott as the Bible teacher at Urbana for the last several conferences. And he will be the featured speaker next month when I go to a conference in Budapest. So I will sit at his feet and learn. That's the joy of a teacher. Just like the joy of a parent to see your child excel what you've ever been able to do. And after all, if you've done your job well, don't you think the student ought to learn a little bit more than you know? <laughs> I hope that we've saved them from a few blunders that we've made. And I find a great joy in going to where students are and then learning from them. And they often become then my teachers. Someone mentioned today old Lyle Dorset, who taught at Wheaton College. Any of you ever encountered Lyle Dorset? When I met him, he was just a brand new convert. He was green as a gourd. We began a relationship, and when I was at Wheaton for 10 years, we got together for every week for lunch, or he would come to my office to pray, or I would go to his. And after a few years, I taught everything I knew, but he was continuing to excel in his learning, and he outran me. So now, I feel like I'm being discipled by Dorset. Although, in his modesty, he would probably say, well, Dr. Coleman, he's been a help to me. But it's a great joy to see those that you've invested in move on into greater areas of service and probably in areas that you could never penetrate yourself. Another question. Yes. Uh, you mentioned this morning the difference between uh, making disciples as a lifestyle mm -hmm. versus as an objective. I was wondering if you could expound on that and maybe describe what a person would look like who is doing either side of that spectrum. And this is a question I appreciate. I alluded to it in the beginning last night, but I didn't clarify it. To me, the Great Commission is not a gift of the Spirit. It is not a special office that you assume by some religious uh, authorization, like being an elder or a pastor or a missionary. The Great Commission is a command given to the church and the only way that we can relate to it individually as a member of the church is in our personal lifestyle. So the priesthood of all believers, which is one of the great affirmations of the Protestant Reformation, actually takes on flesh. 
Because as a lifestyle, you are living out the Great Commission every day where you live. You do it where God's planted you now. Maybe it's in the Army or Air Force. Or maybe your wife there at home. Or a child that's now at the university as a student. Well, they still live under the mandate of the Great Commission. Their context is different. But in that situation, you can still make disciples. That's what puts excitement to it. You don't have to be in the pulpit preaching. You don't have to be in Africa as a missionary to be making disciples. You can make them right now here at Fort Bragg. You can do it where you live. And you do it in faith, knowing that God is producing the harvest. You may see it. Maybe the next person that comes along will see it but it will come you see you live by faith and it's that faith that gives excitement as you look out upon the fields because you can believe even when it looks like they've just been recently planted but you can envision what's going to happen on down the way and you can envision in these young men and women that you are relating to now as you see some of their gifts and their potential you can envision how ten years from now my, they're going to have a powerful impact and think of what it will be twenty years from now isn't that the way you relate to your children especially as they come along don't you begin to talk about more what they're going to do when they finish high school they may go to college they may go into the, the army or someplace you begin to envision for them what they're going to do. And it's in their lifestyle that they're going to fulfill the Great Commission. Let's get over the idea that you've got to have some knock-down, drag-out revelation from heaven like the Apostle Paul before you get serious about obeying the Great Commission. That has been a, a, a limitation on the church for hundreds of years. And we've said now it's the clergy, it's the missionaries, it's the full-time ordained ministers that are going to do it. And we haven't done it. It was never intended to be done by a few individuals. This is a mission the whole church shares. And until we can bring it down to this level of lifestyle every day, we don't understand the priesthood of all believers. Aren't we all priests? Don't we all have a ministering uh, effectiveness with others as a priest? Not just with God, but with our fellow man. This is what we thought we discovered in the Protestant Reformation, but we've still got a long way to go to make it applicable in the church today. Thank God for the navigators. You're, I think you're in the great Protestant Reformation. You're trying to make it relevant. One more question. Yes. Uh, this morning you were talking about gifts. Uh, you never seen Jesus really emphasize gifts in the Gospels or the New Testament. How are gifts relative to the Great Commission? We work in the way that God has made us. And I wouldn't get too hung up on gifts to the exclusion of just the way God has made you. And there is a distinction technically between a skill, which everyone has, and between a gift, which is supernatural. I know those things. I wouldn't try to figure it all out. Just do what you can do. And you will be gifted in the area where likely, when you put it into practice, you find fulfillment. And it seems natural. Now, if you have to whip yourself every time you do something, the probability is you're not particularly gifted in doing that job. <laughs> but when you're working in the area like God made you, there's a fulfillment, there's an inner sense of peace and satisfaction. So do it in the way that you can understand and let the, the theologians try to figure out all the explanations of the gifts that they haven't figured it out themselves. <laughs> Another question, it's not fair to me to have all the fun, and I enjoy the questions up here most of all, because I don't know what you're going to ask, but I know what I'm going to say. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I guess we've come then to the place where I need to move on to that last principle of the impartation. As I said... It's in the middle of the book because I didn't want you to wait till you got to the end of the book to discover 
the power that makes it all possible. You should begin to enjoy the witness of the Spirit and the ministry of the Spirit from the very beginning. And this is the promise of the Great Commission. Having given the command to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I commanded you. He closes with the promise. You remember what it is? Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Oh, I love to dwell on that promise. Because it's not realized when you get to heaven. Did you, did you recognize? That's a promise you live in now as you go and make disciples. That's the provision. You do it with Him. And as you go forth in His presence, everything else that you've learned comes alive. Because the Spirit is the one who lifts up Christ and effects in us what Christ has accomplished for us. We are introduced to the Spirit in the very first chapter of the book of Genesis. When we are told the Spirit moved upon the face of the deep. He was the power of God in creating the cosmos. Just as Job testified by the Spirit, the heavens were laid out. We know God as the Father in His administration of the universe. We recognize Him as the Son in the revelation of Himself. But we know Him as the Spirit in operation, in power. He's the one in history that accomplishes now what he had planned from the beginning a plan that finally consummated in the coming of his son when he offered that redeeming sacrifice at Calvary and then in triumph rose from the dead and soon returned back to the throne where he reigns today in absolute authority and power. And I'm going to speak of that tomorrow. And he, in that place of authority, now is in control of what's going on in the world. And someday he will return in the clouds of glory and reign over his kingdom. But it's the Spirit now who's carrying on His work. But actually, He had been at work from the very beginning. We know in creation He's the one who created the stars and laid out the worlds. But He's the one who made us in the image of God. And those early chapters of Genesis tell us as God fashioned this creature from the dust of the earth, He breathed into him the breath of life. And he became a living soul. The word breathe is the root for the word spirit. He spiritualized this creature. And that's the, we, the reason he began now to live and move in communion with God. And in that reality of the Spirit, Adam and Eve had fellowship with God. They would walk together in the garden. And certainly God had provided everything that was necessary for their happiness in that Garden of Eden. But... We know the story all too well as Satan who appeared as an advisor, as a friend, in deception appealed to the self-centeredness of our forebearers. First it was Eve and then she gave of the bitten fruit to her husband. But together they brought ruin to the human race. 
And that fellowship that they had known in the beginning was lost. They still had the capacity. They were still made in the image of God. But the means by which they could enjoy communion with God was no longer present. The spirit was withdrawn. God still loved them. He still was working to redeem them. And even in the garden, he gave that promise In the third chapter, the day would come when from the seed of woman, one would crush under its heel the serpent. It's the first promise of redemption. God, from the very beginning, has planned to save a people for his glory. And how that would take place is represented also there in the garden when God slew the animal and from the skin of that ram fashioned clothing for Adam and Eve to wear so they could appear in his presence. And those bloody garments wrapped around them the promise. God through blood would affect the redemption of a fallen world. But it would only come by the offering of one who was innocent, who would die in the place of the guilty. And that theme is picked up all through the Bible, through the sacrificial systems of Israel. And finally it consummates as we shall look at tomorrow at Calvary. But the Spirit is the one who is working through all of these means to restore a fallen race to the purpose for which they were made. So that we might know fellowship with God and enjoy Him forever. This, as the old Westminster Catechism says, is the chief end of man to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. God made us so that we could be full of joy, not in ourselves, but in Him. He is our joy. And beholding Him is the fulfillment of all that we were made for. But the Spirit will accomplish that. And so through the Old Testament we see again and again references to how the Spirit is at work to complete a redemptive purpose that God has for the world. It's called our attention when we see Joseph in Egypt. And the Bible tells us that Pharaoh, that pagan king, recognized the Spirit was with Joseph. That's what distinguished him from other people. And in that particular time, Joseph was an instrument by which God rallied his people around himself and preserved a posterity through whom someday the Savior would come. The Spirit was very present with Moses. And when the administration was too strong for him and he couldn't handle it, again, you see a principle of selection. He was told to select 70 elders and God would give them the same spirit that was with Moses. That would qualify them for the task they were to do. When it came time to build the tabernacle according to the pattern that was in heaven. So this replica which was really a visible symbol of the plan of redemption was something that to those early Jews would be very meaningful in its significance. So he just didn't leave it up to anybody who wanted to come along and throw in a few days work. He filled Bezael with the spirit of wisdom, we're told. That he would be the architect and the craftsman who would devise this construction according to the plan in heaven. Even those who made the work of uh, 
that the robes the priests would use in their work. We're told they were filled with the spirit of wisdom for this task. You wonder now why would a detail like that be called our attention? What's so significant about the robes the priest wore? The normal robe, of course, was pure white. Well, the symbolical significance has great, great meaning. Because they couldn't minister in their own righteousness. They always had symbolically to put on the covering of one who was righteous as represented by this pure white robe. There's only one incident in the Bible where a priest offered an acceptable sacrifice to God when he did not have on that proper covering of a robe. You remember where it is? Some of you Bible students? Hmm? No? Hmm? Not Job. Job didn't offer any sacrifices. Well, Jesus is after the order of Melchizedek, but Melchizedek is not the one who offered the sacrifice. This is one of those examples who shows how meticulous the Bible is in every detail. It's at Calvary. And the Gospels tell us before Jesus was nailed to the cross, he was stripped of his clothing. He died naked on that tree. Nothing could be more blasphemous, more heinous in the eyes of God than for a priest to come into his presence naked, but nakedness was a sign of our fallen nature and sin. That's why the priest, even under their robe, wore bloomers that stretched down here below their thighs. Because when they leaned over the altar, they might possibly expose their nakedness. But Jesus, you see, did not need any symbolical covering. Because by his own integrity, his own righteousness, he was the blameless Lamb of God. And as the high priest of heaven, after the order of Melchizedek, he offered himself to God. And we read in Hebrews 9, 14, even the offering of the sacrifice without any blemish was by the Holy Spirit. God works by His Spirit. Always has. When He has a task to accomplish. So, it's not surprising to see these frequent references through the Old Testament. There were times that the Spirit would come upon a person that was certainly not an example that we would want to follow. There was a time he was with Saul. The time came, though, when the Spirit departed from him. There was a time when the Spirit was with Samson. You remember that? But then, in his folly and his sin, the Spirit left him. He tried to do the same old thing, but the Spirit wasn't in it. The tragedy of any ministry is to try to do what God calls you to do in your own strength or in your own wisdom. When God calls you, He doesn't expect you to do it in your own ability. He gives you the strength, the wisdom, and the power by the Holy Spirit. Always has. It's not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord. The greatest example of this is the prophet in the Old Testament who could hear and receive the message that God wanted to communicate to his people. And he would be inspired by the Spirit, quickening his mind and his memory, enabling him actually to construct in words how that message could be communicated without in any sense corrupting its truth. So that when the message came to us, 
you could accept it as being absolutely true. Our whole doctrine of inspiration is rest upon this fact that these men were not of their own wisdom giving these messages, but they were borne along by the Spirit of the living God. And that's why I hold this book. This is the Word written by the Holy Spirit's inspiration. And the Word written in this book is the same Word that reveals to me by the Spirit, Jesus Christ my Savior. And that's why I hold this book when I speak. This is why I bring it into the classroom when I lecture and lay it on the desk before my notes. Because when I see this book, and especially when I hold it, I feel like Jesus is holding my hand. This is the Word of God! And it is mine by the Spirit who made it a reality by inspiring every word. And by that same power, in the fullness of time, just as the Spirit had said through Isaiah, a virgin would conceive. And she would bring forth in human history God's one and only Son. And this would not be by natural means. As we're told in the Gospels, it was the Spirit of God who planted the seed of the Father in the womb of Mary. Jesus was born physically at the moment of his entrance into the world like we are. The Bible is more precise from the very moment of conception. He was born of the Spirit. And by that same Spirit, He was led during the days of His incarnate ministry. For example, we read how the Spirit led Him out into the desert. It's interesting, isn't it? The angels ministered to Him, but it was the Spirit of God who directed His steps. When He was invited for the first time to speak in His old home synagogue in Nazareth, as is recorded now in the fourth chapter of Luke, he turned back to what is now the 61st chapter of Isaiah. And he began to read that ancient promise. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the good news to proclaim liberty to the captive. And he finished reading the passage and then he closed that Old Testament scroll and he announced to that startled congregation, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Do you see what he's doing? He's announcing that his work now in the flesh is according to the word that had been promised 800 years before. In his ministry of preaching and deliverance, proclaiming liberty, his his ministry of compassion was in the power and the demonstration of the Holy Spirit. In that power he did mighty works. And some of the scribes and Pharisees, seeing this miraculous power, unwilling to recognize it was from God, took the other alternative. Since it's supernatural, they ascribed this power to Beelzebub, to Satan. He's also supernatural. But in so doing, they were blaspheming what the Spirit of God was doing. Because through these mighty works, the Spirit was calling people to believe on Him whom the Father had sent. And if you turn away from the revelation which is perfect in the Son, you turn away from God's offer of redemption. And if you continue in that state of rebellion and unbelief, you are living in an unforgiven sin. That's what's unpardonable. 
He that believes not, the Bible says, is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the Son of God. People today are living in blasphemy against the Spirit. They may be in ignorance, but if you die without the blood of Christ covering sin, there is no pardon. And the Spirit is making that truth known to this world. That's the message that comes through when the gospel is preached. You can resist a preacher. You can turn off a television evangelist. But you cannot turn away from the truth of God when the Spirit brings it with convicting power. And when you do so by your own willful rebellion, you bring upon yourself the judgment of deliberate rejection of salvation. The Spirit is a person after all. He has feelings. The Bible tells us He can be grieved. He can be resisted. He can be lied to. It's dangerous to trifle with the Spirit of God. And you can see why Jesus then was careful to make known to His disciples it's by the Spirit that they would go forth and do His work. And this comes out so beautifully in the upper room discourse recorded in John chapters 14, 15, and 16. It's the greatest teaching we have in the Bible on the Holy Spirit. They have finished the Paschal meal. The traitor has left. And Jesus is alone now with the eleven. And he begins now to explain how they're going to be able to continue on the work that he will finish in redemption. And he says in that 14th chapter and verse 12, Everyone that believes on me shall do my work. And greater works than these you will do. Because I'm going to the Father. He's going back to the place where he reigns in absolute authority and power. And... In that authority, the Holy Spirit is going to come and is going to rest upon the church. And everyone that believes, he's speaking again to the whole church. Everyone in the church will enter into a greater ministry than Jesus has known himself. It's hard to imagine. But there's no exegetical way on which you can limit that statement of fact and I can see at least in one way that it is fulfilled, being fulfilled today. Not that in the church you see greater miracles, of course not, or greater teaching or greater preaching. But there is one way in which we are seeing greater works. It's in the harvest. There were 500 witnesses, we are told, at the resurrection. And that is a, a sizable number after about three years of ministry. But if you were to list the great evangelists of the world, you might not include Jesus. Why, more than 500 frequently respond to an invitation in the Billy Graham crusade. You see, you would miss the whole point. Jesus had not come himself to evangelize and disciple the world. He had come to make the sacrifice and to prepare some disciples for that mission. And he gave the church the privilege and responsibility to take what he would finish and make it known to the ends of the earth. He really did the hard work. He gave us the joy of bringing in the harvest. Greater works than these are being wrought today across the earth. In fact, we are probably living today in the greatest season of harvest in the history of the church. 
I wish we could see it in North America. But if you go to China, you will see it. Where at least a hundred million believers now gather to give their praise to God. You see it all across South America, many parts of Africa and Asia. The church is alive and growing. And I have to say too, the principles of discipleship are being rediscovered in so many of these places that have been ignored. Places where they haven't had a lot of seminary training. Where they haven't had the professors from the western world come and tell them how to do it. Thank God they've gone back to the Bible. They've discovered that in the scriptures there is the plan that we can follow every one of us. Amen. The harvest is beginning. And we're living in a generation that's just in the forefront of this great final day of the ingathering of the people of God. We don't see the end yet, but I can testify it is certain. Yes, he says you will do greater works. Because I'm going back to the Father and the first thing I do will ask Him to send another Counselor. The Spirit of Truth. He will not just be with you, He will be in you. Oh, what a promise. Another Counselor. Alas Parakletos. The word... Comforter or counselor means one who stands by your side, one who answers your questions, one who represents you with authority. It might be translated an advocate like a lawyer. Have any of you ever been in a situation where you needed a lawyer to represent you in a courtroom? Ever had that experience? It's nothing to be ashamed of. That's an honorable profession. And if you're in trouble, let me advise you to get a good lawyer. <laughs> Someone who not only understands the law, who may have some influence with the judge. <laughs> There's a sense that for about three years, Jesus had been their advocate. He was there beside them. He could answer their question. As long as he was there, they felt confident. The problem was, you see, he said he's going away. Going back to the Father. And so this great discourse begins in that 14th chapter, Let not your hearts be troubled. Don't be afraid. I'm not going to leave you orphans. Another is coming. And it's that word another that's so significant. In the Greek language, there are two words that translate another. One that compares two things that are different in object as well as quality. By comparing me with this lovely chair here, we're two different objects, but really we don't have anything in common. But if you wanted to compare me with Dick, we're two different objects, two different persons, but you wanted to emphasize we have the same quality of life. We act alike. We think alike. We could even be blood brothers. You would use the word that Jesus used when he said there is another. Alas, prolactitas. He's not talking about another theory. He's talking about another person. One just like himself. The difference is in person. From the second member of the Holy Trinity to the third member. From the visible word in Christ to the invisible spirit. But in quality. In holiness. In power. In love, the Spirit of God is the Spirit of Christ. He is the one living now among us. And everything that you have come to know in Christ is also true of the present Comforter who is with us. And Jesus said, I'll be with you always. I'll not leave you. I'll not forsake you. I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. That is the promise of the Great Commission. Does it thrill you? We're in the presence of the living God. He's here now, witnessing to the truth of His Word and bearing witness in our spirit that it's real. 
You can see why he told those disciples to tarry until this became a reality. And so he told them to go back to the upper room in Jerusalem where they had earlier heard this great teaching on the Holy Spirit. And you stay there until this promise is fulfilled. And so after he ascended back into the heavens, they went back to this room. And we're told there were about 120 of them that gathered there. And it was during the Pentecost season. The feast of the first fruits of the harvest. And while people were bringing in their grain offerings and laying them on the altars in Jerusalem, celebrating the harvest, there was another harvest that was beginning in that city. A harvest of the Spirit that would be infinitely greater than anything this world had ever known. And so they were there, tarrying together for ten days. We don't know a great deal about what transpired in that interval of time. It did occur to them that they needed a replacement for the traitor because that had been ordained by the Spirit through David. And therefore they got together and selected a replacement to take the place of Judas. We don't know the other details that transpired, but we are led to believe by the way they took care of a replacement, they certainly were very careful to do everything they understood the Word asked them to do. I can imagine that Peter stood up as the tears streamed down his face and confessed how he had denied his Lord three times and asked for forgiveness. I can imagine John and James standing up and confessing how they had been proud. And they wanted to sit at the right and the left hand of the throne and they apologized, asked for forgiveness. I don't know everything that happened. But I know this, the Bible tells us they finally came together in one mind, in one accord. They were united. And when you get 120 people united in the Spirit, you have power. And while they were seated there, they're not wringing their hands, they're not walking around shouting, they're not trying to beg God to do something. God will keep his word. They know that. And on the last day of that feast, while they were there assembled, just like you are here tonight, suddenly there was a sound of a mighty rushing wind that swept through the room in power. And then a ball of fire seemed to come through the ceiling, and it separated now. And a flame sat upon the head of each member present. What a difference. In the Old Testament, individuals were empowered for special reasons, for particular assignments. But now, the Spirit is dispersed among all the believers. And He sat on the head of the church. It's the same word that is used of Jesus, Peter explained, when Jesus sat down at the right hand of the throne. Do you see the analogy? Jesus has returned to heaven. He sat down. The king always sits. The commoners stand. And now the spirit comes and sits on the head of each member of the church. He has taken over. He's in control. He is representing now the authority from on high. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and went forth and began to declare the wonderful works of God. But the power was not in the wind or the fire or in the tongues. Oh, that's often the mistake we make. The power is not in any sign. The power is in the presence of the reigning Savior who now has come into the fellowship and indwelt their lives, 
who is bringing to fruition in their own experience the promise of the Great Commission. I am with you. Now and always. That's why they could go forth now and begin to tell the story. And that day when they gave their witness and Peter then extended an invitation, about 3,000 were converted more in one day than Jesus had won in over three years of personal ministry. And every day after that we are told others were added to the church as they were being saved. The book of Acts doesn't even have a conclusion. Have you noticed it? It breaks off virtually in the middle of a sentence as the work is still going on. And that indicates to me the last chapter hasn't been written yet. We're still living in the age of the Spirit, the age of the harvest. And it will continue until this gospel has reached the ends of the earth and He gathers His people from the nations. Oh, this is our reality, our experience. And ten times in the book of Acts, We're told that those Christians were filled with the Spirit. It seemed to be the favorite of Luke in describing how a change had come over the church. They were possessed. They were overflowing with something that was not their own. And he could only describe it as being filled with the Spirit that was evident in Christ. And they went out and began to minister in His name with boldness that was extraordinary. And when they were threatened and beaten, they didn't pray to be delivered. They prayed that the Lord would give them boldness still to speak. And they were so generous, they gave of their alms freely. And they were filled with joy. And the world took note of them and said, we can't understand it. Why, these people look like They have the love of Jesus in them. Oh, they didn't know the half of it. Jesus was in them by the Spirit. And that was the reason the church was going forth in such power. Not everyone, of course, in those early days had that fullness. And we're told when Paul wrote the letter to the Ephesians that they should live up to the standard. The standard is to be filled with the Spirit all the time. And he says, you should always live this way. Not like those who are drunken with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Bringing forth the fruits of joy and happiness. And anything less than that is below the New Testament norm and the privilege and the promise of the Great Commission. And the great tragedy is that we so often try to do this work in our own power. You can't do God's work in your strength. He never asks us to do it when He sends us the Spirit of Christ Himself will enable us to do it. You say, but how can we be filled? Well, first you believe the promise that what is written is true. I remember a few years ago I stayed at a hotel in Berlin. It's the first international congress that Billy Graham had called. When I came home the first night I went down the hall and just about everybody had put their shoes outside the door. And I recognize that means that they'll be picked up during the night by a porter and then the next morning they'll be out there, they'll be shined. And there'll be a hefty uh, price on your bill when you check out. And I mentioned the next day, I'd never been in a hotel before where it seemed like everybody but me was getting their shoes signed at night. He said, well, aren't you using that privilege? I said, oh, of course not. I can't afford it. I could hardly get over here. He said, well, don't you know, in this hotel, that's on the bill of fare. You're paying for it, whether you utilize it or not. (laughs) Well, there I was walking around like a bum with old scuffed up shoes when I was entitled to first class treatment. And I think that's the way it is with the church. We have discouraged ourselves by trying to bemoan all of our limitations and our frustrations. And we simply haven't believed the promise and laid hold upon it. The Spirit has come. You don't beg Him to come. He's here. You open your heart and receive 
by faith the promise and that promise is continuous every day he gives the spirit to those that obey him and as you walk by faith you live in that fullness that joy unspeakable and full of glory don't settle for anything less that's how you can go forth wherever God leads you and do what he calls you to do but it won't be in your strength or wisdom it will be in his shall we pray